For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Historian Laurel Seagal joins me to discuss her beautifully narrated memoir of how she has fought cancer four times, titled Cancer, A Love Story. Your book narrates your journey to come to terms with the untold challenges of facing the dreaded disease cancer, but you decided to tell it as a love story. Why a love story? The whole notion of love story has to be understood in the tragic sense of the word love story, not as a Hollywood romance. It's a love story with all the difficulties that come with love, with all the love that comes with love, a complex love story. And I chose that as the title and as a way of writing the book because for me relationships are so central to my story. And they're relationships with both my husband and my children and my mother, but also with people around me in the community because ultimately that is how I feel I survived my journey, was through those relationships. You have written previous books, such as the one about making of Constitutional Hill and about the history of Soweto. Did you draw on your earlier experiences in writing this book about being a four-time cancer survivor? What I think I had from writing those previous history books was a love of the word and a love of putting the word onto a page and creating order and pictures on a page. So I think that although this is so different to be writing about myself versus like a history book on Soweto or the Constitution, there is the act of writing that transcends both kinds of works that I've been involved in. And that's a very satisfying process for me to see how a story takes shape, whether it's a story of the township or your own life. Tell us about your first encounter with cancer at the age of 23 and how it has changed your life. So that first encounter with cancer was very different to my other encounters because I was young. Um, as you say, I was 23. I was living in Yeovil. It was at the height of the state of emergency. It was a wild time in our country, both in terms of the politics, but also life in this newly um, developing community, which was becoming increasingly non-racial because it was a previously white community. And I was living a life that was quite edgy. We were all living in communes. We were all going in and out of each other's houses and very involved in politics. So when I heard my cancer diagnosis at 23, I couldn't believe it, but nor could I take it very seriously because I had other preoccupations. And one of those preoccupations was how to capture my husband-to-be and sh ensure that he committed himself to, my, uh, to his relationship with me um, because at that point we had just met. So I had kind of repressed what cancer meant in those days. I didn't take seriously my mortality, even though it was a stage three melanoma. I didn't really deal with the impact of illness and disease in my life in the way that I was going to in the years to come. Would you say that this journey has taught you some valuable life lessons? So I think one of the most surprising things about having cancer four times was how much I've learned about myself and the world around me. I think that illness forces you to look inside in a way that you cannot or you don't have to when you are not faced with your own mortality. There's something about being pushed against the wall and having to confront your existence on this planet that really sends you into a level of introspection that certainly I hadn't achieved without it. I'm not saying other people can't, but my journey was such that when illness confronted me in the way that it did, I searched for questions and answers in a new way. And I learned about love and about asking for help and about kindness in a whole new way. I didn't know what that simple word kindness meant before I went through this journey. Your second diagnosis was different because you had a family and you also had many things to consider before choosing the right treatment. Can you tell us what went through your head when you were diagnosed for the second time? The first thing that went through my head was immense anger because I thought I had done my time. Even though I was 23 and I was young, I thought 
okay, I'm going to get away. Most people are going to develop cancer in their life, but I've done it at 23. It's not going to be my life again. And so when I heard my diagnosis again, I was very, very angry. I thought, this is unfair, that word that comes to mind. And it was very difficult because then I had two young children and the kind of confrontation with cancer when you have a family is very different to when you're a young single person looking just after your own needs. So I think it was much more scary, although it has to be said that it was discovered at a very early stage and I wasn't frightened about not living. It was just about having to go through traumatic mastectomy and treatment. That was the point that I was very upset about. You also describe your dead diagnosis as my husband's favorite movie, Groundhog Day. It must have been hell. Briefly tell us about the ordeal. When I was diagnosed with, for the third time, that is when I think true trauma set in to my heart. I could not believe it. I thought once, okay. Twice, okay. Three times, impossible, before I'm the age of 50. And the problem was, the third diagnosis was very serious. So it was a 6.5 centimeter tumor and I did not know how or if I was going to survive. Um, and so that sense of Groundhog Day was unbearable in a way because it was going back into the breast cancer um, surgery where, where Carol Ben worked, my breast surgeon, and re-experiencing all the fears that had gone before with my first breast cancer diagnosis. So I really had that sense of this can't be happening again. Um, and that was my struggle. Why is this illness repeatedly choosing me? Mm. Now your fourth one. Can you briefly tell us about your battle with the fourth one? So if I was shocked at the third one, the fourth one really got you have to understand that the fourth one happened at a time that I was only eight weeks post radiation and finishing all my treatments and surgeries. So I had really said to myself, I am now at the end of a very long marathon. And when the dermatologist looked at me and said, do you have any relationship with a man upstairs? I didn't understand what he was saying to me. But as I left the office, I understood that he was saying to me, do you know that this is happening to you again? And I think, again, that anger took hold. And what I've learned in this journey is how to work through that kind of anger and that it's not fair emotion. Do you have any advice to someone who's perhaps going through the cancer treatment who may have lost hope? I think hope is a very interesting word because I understand how easy it is to lose hope. But for me, hope was not just a choice, it was an obligation. Because I had children and because I had a husband, I felt like I had to hope for them too, not just for myself. I had to introduce hope into the equation. And I think there are many different ways to find hope. And what I would say to someone in a position where they're feeling hopeless is there's always something you can find, even if it's a small thing to hope for. And it could be that you, at your child's graduation in a week's time, or uh, that you hope you, you, you can write letters to your children if, if you are facing a terminal diagnosis. But I think that there's always spaces and places to find hope and that the way to do it is to ask for help if you're feeling hopeless and seek that hope. What would you say to someone who thinks that cancer mainly affects older people as well as those people who think that it mainly affects white people? So I would say to them cancer is a disease that knows no class, it knows no race, that knows no boundaries in terms of age, that the people who get cancer these days are young, old, fragile, starting off life, and that we have a responsibility, like we do with HIV AIDS and TB and the other illnesses that we see as young, affecting young people, that we have a responsibility not to be ignorant, 
to learn about our bodies, to take charge of our bodies, to notice what is normal when we're talking about breasts, what is a normal breast, and to discover if something is not right, what is going on, because so many people ignore signs in their body that could be very easily dealt with. And that is a message to young people that cancer does not have to be a death sentence that it has such fear attached to it. But in fact, if you detect cancer early, it's an awful disease and no one can say anything else, but you can prevent it from being a death sentence very easily. Mm. I'm sure you had a lot of people who have supported you through your trying times. What would you like to say to them? I'd like to say to them that I had the hope that I speak about and I have the courage to be here today in the way that I do because of the love that people showed me and the care that they showed me and that you can never underestimate what a gesture of kindness, care and love means to someone going through a hard time and it doesn't just have to be cancer, it can be any hard time. That That is how people carry on and find strength to, to confront difficult moments in their lives. October is Cancer Awareness Month. As a cancer survivor, do you think more emphasis is done to bring awareness about this disease? So I think that it's been incredible to watch the growing sense of awareness around breast cancer through the October month. I think that there is so much more knowledge about breast cancer than there was before. But I have to say that there still feels to me like such fear and shame and silence attached to the disease. And I think that we have a long way to go before we are truly a country that's confronting this illness. I meet too many women who feel shamed by their diagnosis and too many people who wait too long to go to doctors. That the fact that the death rate from breast cancer is nine times what it is in the United States, in South Africa, means that we are not confronting breast cancer in the way that we should be. So it's like I, we've come far, but not far enough. And I think there's a road still to travel. And that the other thing I would say is that Breast Cancer Awareness Month isn't just about wearing a pink t-shirt and, and having your pen and ribbon that says I support breast cancer awareness. It's about thinking what it means for you and for your mother and your sister and the other people in your family and talking about this disease so that it becomes part of our everyday discourse, not something out there that happens to someone else. That was historian Laura Segal speaking to Crema Media's Polity about her memoir titled Cancer, A Love Story.